We're going to move on now to uh, terribly sad news, I'm afraid. Uh, Liz Truss has been reanimated. That's right, the most disastrous prime minister in British history who managed to cost this country more than a billion pounds a day in her very short 44-day reign, um, has written a 4,000-word essay because she's got time to kill now, um, in one of yesterday's unpopular papers, in which she blamed it on the left-wing political establishment. She says it would all have worked, but she just wasn't given a chance. Uh, This morning, uh, some of those die-hard lefties who blocked her, like um, George Osborne, have been quoted telling her to put a sock in it. Nigel, this seems to be part of a campaign to sort of reinstate her political credibility, her reputation, perhaps uh, apparently sort of try to shape the Tory party in the years to come, uh, sow the seeds for what will come after the next election. Does she have any support at all? Or is this just a one woman delusional nightmare that we're all stuck in? Um, well, what the, the mystery at the moment is actually what she's after. You're absolutely right. She's trying to re- rehabilitate herself. You're going to see an awful lot more of Liz Truss uh, in the coming days and weeks. She's planning all sorts of media appearances. Um, I think she actually wants to try try and rescue uh, uh, her shredded reputation. It's probably the the main reason for this. It's a very odd way of doing it. The the idea to accuse um, uh, uh, the the market speculators, currency speculators, of being some kind of left-wing cabal of economists is really quite peculiar. Mm. Now, I've sat through, I don't know, about sort of 50 odd budgets and financial statements in my time. And when I heard this one, I was sort of sitting in the House of Commons press gallery and looking down at the Chancellor's head. And I really couldn't believe what I was hearing. That budget was totally and utterly bonkers. And when he got to the bit about, oh, let's scrap the top top 45% rate of tax, you kind of thought, what is he doing? Why? What, what's the reason for that? There was no great clamour for it. Mm. Uh, it just seemed to be so, something he threw in. And the reason the markets reacted the way they did is because they hadn't costed any of the plans they were doing. So they were about to spend £45 billion pounds without any kind of costing at all, that's what threw the markets into into panic. Uh, I mean, these people are there not for politics, they're there for profits. And if they see their profits going down, that's the reason they reacted the way they did. So it was the budget, budget what did it, if you like. Yeah, I suspect that she saw... You know, Rishi Sunak getting away, I suppose, with spending 400 billion and thought, well, how can they get upset about my 40 odd billion? You know, this is it's so much less. Why are they upset at me and not at him? But that was a pandemic. And although things were done in a rush in both instances, um, the markets wanted the economy supported in that way during the pandemic. And they didn't want what Truss and Kwarteng were doing. Um, so which is why they reacted so badly. Now, Mike says, oh, Mike, this is evil and twisted, I'm afraid. I, for one, would welcome Liz Truss as leader of a conservative opposition, preferably sooner rather than later. I think, actually, Mike, um, although I can see your point, it is always, always bad for a sitting government when the opposition is weak because it means that that government starts to become, as we saw uh, when Ed Miliband was leading Labour, for example, and Cameron was in charge, you, you see a government that decides it can do things without checking the homework first. Right? They don't need to worry about it because the other guys have got nothing. Um, and they don't get scrutinised properly. They don't get hauled over the coals. Their, their homework isn't checked. And they start to feel entitled and that they ought to be there and they have to be there and there is no alternative. And whether the sitting government is Labour or Tory, that is bad news for the country, I would suggest. From your perspective, Nigel, of being in this job for a very long time, what do you think? Should yeah, this be the leader of the opposition? <laughs> I mean, what you do need is, is you've got to have a, 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 a good, strong opposition. Uh, also, I throw in there that the the House of Lords, the House of Lords, does quite a lot of scrutiny because they've got a lot of experts their end, which is quite handy. And also, uh, the select committee system in the the House of Commons, uh, they do a pretty good job of scrutinising the departments they're looking at. But yes, when it comes down to what goes on in the chamber, you need an opposition that really works. 
banks. Now, um, I think Keir Starmer is actually uh, pretty effective a, a, about this. He certainly, because he, he is a, an advocate, or certainly was before, he can sort of forensically dissect what the government is getting wrong, which is good stuff. Um, I'd like to hear some, some more ideas from Labour about how they would repair it, because that's the way they're going to win the next election. Yeah, I was speaking to a new peer a little while ago who said he found it absolutely terrifying to be in the House of Lords because you walk in there and you, you start to hear them speak and see the debates and you realise how terrifyingly good and expert these people are. And what he didn't say, but the obvious implication, is that when you're in the House of Commons, you're quite used to being surrounded by egotistical idiots. You don't have to do too much homework at all. Um, so I suspect that may be a part of... Part of government's problem and certainly part of Liz Truss's problem, perhaps. We shall wait and see, won't we?